Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I am a psychiatrist. I uh, work uh, here in Montreal, and I, uh, my clinical work is specialized in treating young uh, people and older people who have uh, psychotic illnesses. Uh, and today, I'm, I've been asked to speak about the, uh, the link between cannabis and psychosis. And I'm going to try and, um, and show you a little bit what the evidence has, uh, has shown us. So to get right to the point, what the evidence has shown us is that cannabis is what is called a contributory cause or a component cause of psychosis. And that is um, a statement that would have been very controversial 15 years ago, a lot less controversial 10 years ago. Uh, that would be, and at this point, if you go to a schizophrenia conference and say that there's not really any controversy there anymore, I recognize there might still be some controversy in this room, and that brings me to my conflicts of interest. Um, you know, in medical talks, we always have to give our conflicts of interest or explain what drug companies have given us what amounts of money. No drug companies give, have given me any money, but my real, the real conflicts of interest here that I need to declare are First of all, I don't especially like uh, marijuana. I have a lot of friends who do like it a lot and, and smoke it frequently. I have no particular moral opposition to the legal, uh, legalization of marijuana, nor do I have any particular feelings of support for it. Um, and so all that to say that what I'm trying to show you here is just, just the data. And we can um, and look at how that data has been used to come up with this idea of cannabis being a contributory cause, uh, cause of psychosis. So, the data goes back a long time. Um, of course, uh, ever since the era of, of reefer madness, uh, uh, we know that uh, people have been saying that psycho, or people have been observing that psychosis can be seen in cannabis users, both acute paranoia at the time of consumption, as I'm sure uh, many people have, uh, have seen, perhaps experienced themselves, uh, but also longer la lasting uh, episodes or cases of psychosis. And there are case reports of this in the medical literature going back, uh, back to the 1930s. Uh, and we also know that if you uh, go into a, a clinic where you're treating people with schizophrenia or other psychotic illnesses, you're going to come across a lot of people who are uh, actively using uh, marijuana. And, and that's been shown time and time again in the literature as well. One small example in the uh, first episode, psychosis clinic where I work, um, we, uh, we find that about 33% or you know, a third of our clients who come into the program meet criteria not just for not just our cannabis users, but actually meet criteria for a cannabis use disorder, which is to say that their marijuana use is causing them problems in their life. And uh, so it's, you know, it's, a, it's an important problem in those clinics. But now, scientifically, what, what does that tell us about the link between marijuana and psychosis? We have some marijuana users who have, psychos who have psychotic symptoms. We have some mar people with a psychotic illness who consume marijuana. What does that tell us? Scientifically, it actually doesn't tell us anything at all uh, because it does not establish that there is an association, a statistical association between those two things. And how do we do that? We do that through epidemiology, which is this, the science of examining the distribution of an illness as well as the risk factors for that illness in a population. Um, the epidemiology around this uh, has been uh, a long time in the making, let's say, and it started with a, a lot of cross-sectional designs, which is where you go into a population of interest and you, uh, so in this case, for example, you go into a, a schizophrenia clinic and you ask 100 people there how many of them use marijuana, how much marijuana do they use, and then you go out into the general population and find 100 age and gender match controls who don't use marijuana, or sorry, who don't have schizophrenia, and ask them how much marijuana they use. And you compare those numbers, and consistently you'll find that the people in the clinics will use a greater amount or will have more people who are marijuana users. If you, if you do the same kind of design but going into the population and finding people who are marijuana smokers and ask them, how many psychotic type experiences they've had or if they've ever been hospitalized for psychosis or these types of questions, uh, you will find that those numbers are also greater than in um, a, you know, a suitably matched control population. And so that brings us to understand that there is a, an association, a statistical association, a correlation between marijuana use and psychosis. Now, does that mean that marijuana causes psychosis? And it does not. It's one potential explanation for that observation. Um, but there's a number of other potential explanations for that observation that have been, uh, that have been explored and discussed. 
Those include uh, ideas such as, um, well, first of all, the, cause, the, the main causal hypothesis. Cannabis can cause psychosis. But also, there's something called reverse causation, which is the idea that people with psychosis or people uh, who are developing a psychotic illness are more drawn to, develop, uh, to, to seek out cannabis, perhaps as some form of self-medication for some of the symptoms either of psychosis itself or for the prodrome of psychosis. Um, and then there's also non-causal explanations, uh, things like the people who, marijuana, who use marijuana, it unmasks uh, the development of schizophrenia that would have developed anyways, maybe a year or two later, but it was coming anyways, and the marijuana just kind of uh, lit the match that started the fire. Uh, so that's not saying marijuana caused it, it's just made, made, it made it more apparent at this time. Uh, the other main non-causal uh, hypothesis is that marijuana does not cause psychosis, or vice versa, but rather there's a third factor that we don't know what it is, we haven't been able to measure it yet, but that's driving both the marijuana use and the, uh, and the psychosis um, independently of each other. So how can we figure this out? Uh, the best way to, to look at this kind of, uh, tease out some of these kinds of issues uh, is through use of what are called cohort studies. Cohort studies are large studies where you define a group of people at the beginning of the, of the study and you follow them forward in time, measuring um, all kinds of different variables of interest at multiple time points as these people uh, develop. So several of the cohort studies that have been done here have been what are called birth cohorts, where these are people who have been enrolled in the study. For example, every child born in Dunedin, New Zealand in 19, I don't remember what, 1976, let's say, were followed forward as they grew with evaluations every two or three years and, and so on. Others used uh, different designs. Uh, but what's important about all of these studies is that the, the studies were organized in such a way that the, you measure the exposure, which is in this case in environmental terms, the environmental exposure is the exposure to marijuana, and the outcome, which is the development of psychotic symptoms or psychotic illnesses, uh, separately. You measure the marijuana exposure when it happens, let's say when they're 15, 16, 17, you measure the development of the psychotic illness when that happens later on in their life. And that allows you to do a much more fine-tuned analysis, and it also allows you to, to, uh, to really rule in or out things like reverse causation uh, or the self-medication hypothesis. Now, all of this is to try and determine, uh, and I'm going to show you a, a couple of these cohort studies, but, um, but before I get to that, I just want to say all of this is in the, in the idea of trying to prove or disprove causation. And causation is actually kind of a trickier concept in medicine than, than we I think it might it otherwise would be. It's not like, you know, we can say if we hit a ball with a bat, we, the bat has caused the ball to, to fly through the air. That's pretty straightforward. But in medicine, it's never, or in complex biologic systems in general, it's never that straightforward. And a cause is not something that will bring about the outcome each time in most cases, nor is in most cases a cause something that is sufficient for the outcome. Um, a cause is rather something that increases the probability of the outcome, uh, and, but it contributes to a mix of different causes and, and um, contributions to the eventual development of this outcome. And when epidemiologists speak of a cause, um, they tend to refer to a set of criteria that were proposed by a, a scientist named Bradford Hill. In the 1960s, he was one of the scientists who was uh, involved in the, um, you know, in, in making the establishing a link between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. And in a very influential paper he presented, he said that when we look at whether uh, an exposure causes an illness, we should be looking at these these different categories of information to try and make that determination. He proposed that first of all, the strength of the association has to be has to be significant. In other words, there's a, a large impact from being exposed to the exposure to having the outcome. He says that that exposure has, to, that, that relationship has to be consistent. Multiple studies, multiple different populations, multiple different uh, ways uh, or, you know, kind of means of exposure if that's, if that's appropriate. Um, he also proposed that it's more uh, informative if it's a specific outcome. For example, if you, uh, you know, if you look at the uh, link between cigarette smoking and uh, lung cancer, that actually ended up not being very specific because it does increase the risk for a lot of different, uh, a lot of different illnesses. Uh, 
but on the other hand, there's a lot of other environmental uh, exposures that do not increase the risk for lung cancer. So the specificity is something that can, it's not, you know, it's not a, a, key, a key criterion, but it can contribute to that. He also proposed, of course, temporality. In other words, the exposure has to come before the outcome. That only makes sense. And biologic gradient. The more of the exposure you're, you're exposed to, the more likely it is or the more of the outcome you will develop, uh, dose response curve, in other words. He also proposed it has to make sense, biologic plausibility, uh, and uh, also it's not on my list for some reason, but uh, experimental evidence was another uh, a criterion he suggested we could look at, uh, often not possible in, uh, in humans. But, uh, and uh, then he also suggested coherence. It has to kind of make sense in the overall picture of our understanding of the illness. And he also proposed analogy, which is one of I've never really understood and I won't dwell on. So if we look at the marijuana uh, question, what we have so far, after all these cross-sectional studies were done, that, th those studies were, a lot of them were done in the 80s and 90s and, and so on. Uh, what we found is that there is a strong association and there is a consistent association. Now to try and get at some of these other things, uh, we were able to start to answer some of these questions with the publication of these cohort studies that I mentioned earlier. So I'm going to show one of the cohort studies. This is the first large cohort study that was done. This is what's called the Swedish conscript study, a very uh, interesting model where uh, in Sweden, all the men had to go serve in the army. Um, and the authors um, identify, were, uh, sorry, every man who has to go serve in the army before they are allowed to do so is interviewed. So every 18-year-old male in Sweden is interviewed by some sort of psychological professional. And um, obviously, they're determined if there's an active uh, illness, uh, medical illness, psychological illness. Those people don't end up serving in the army if it's severe. Uh, and they also, as part of that, asked about marijuana use. So what we have is a set of uh, 40,000, 40, almost 50,000 people where we know they do not have a psychotic illness at the age of 18 because they were assessed for that. And we know some of them used marijuana, about 5,000. And we know some of them did not use marijuana, about 36,000. Um, and what they found, what they then did is uh, something like 10 years later for the first uh, study, or no, 15 years later for the first study, and, uh, two th and, and they extended it in 2002, in a publication in 2002, they went into the registrar, uh, like registries that a lot of the Scandinavian countries have about who's been hospitalized for what and so on, and linked it to these interviews. And they were able to determine how many of those 18-year-olds were ended up being hospitalized 15 years later for a psychotic illness. And what they found that for the marijuana users at the age of 18, about 1.4% of them had been uh, hospitalized for psychotic illnesses, whereas for the uh, non-users, it was 0.59%. In other words, about twofold greater risk. Uh, they did do analyses to see uh, to, and were able to show that the risk is high both in the 18 to 23 year range and in a later stage of life, which they suggested means it's not necessarily an acute effect of marijuana, although we don't know if they kept on using marijuana or what their cumulative exposure was like after that initial interview. They were also able, though, to look at the effect of the cumulative exposure on the outcome um, by, uh, by dose, in terms of dose response. We're finding that people who smoke marijuana uh, once or twice did not have an increased risk, but the more you smoke marijuana, and once or twice I mean total uses up to the age of 18, uh, but people who have smoked 11 to 50 times or greater than 50 times by that age did have a, a markedly increased uh, risk. Um, so with that study and with the other uh, cohort studies that were, uh, that I'm not going to show you that were, except for, for one in a little bit, uh, that were done, we were able to see that in terms of our criteria, now we are able to have show good evidence for temporality and biologic gradient. Uh, there have been seven of these cohort studies published so far. In 2007, <laughs> six of them were combined into a meta-analysis where you take the results from different studies and use statistical techniques to combine them. And uh, what that study showed was that, uh, and so this study only looked at those prospective cohort studies. And what they found were that marijuana users were 1.4 times more likely to have psychosis. And in the heavy marijuana users, which was defined differently for each of the studies, so it's, it's a bit of a tricky term, but uh, for the heavier marijuana users, it was a two-time, a two-fold increase in probability. Uh, now, that's a good point for me to point out that the 
probability of any random person uh, developing uh, schizophrenia over the course of their life, uh, or psychosis, I should say, over the course of their lifetime, somewhere around one or two percent. So a two-fold increase is still, we're still talking small numbers. And of course, as, uh, as you mentioned, the vast majority of young people who smoke marijuana do not go on to develop any of these types of outcomes, but there is an increased uh, risk. Uh, they also looked at depression, and my colleague is going to be speaking more about depression, so I won't dwell on that. But the, uh, that's what the, uh, the, it looked like uh, graphically. Each line represents one of these cohort studies. Keep in mind, each of these studies has, as a, at a minimum, eight, 900 people in them. Some of them, like the Swedish one, involved uh, 40,000 uh, plus people. And, uh, and so we, the box represents the increased risk. The uh, line represents the confidence, how confident they are, or how wide the confidence intervals are. And this is the overall combination of all that data. So uh, this happened in 2007, which is about, uh, and this was a very influential paper because it really um, decreased the likelihood of finding, uh, of, uh, it really made the, the, the finding of a contributor core of saying that cannabis is a cause of psychosis kind of much more accepted, and it's a paper that's been referred to hundreds and hundreds of times since then. Now, um, so if we look at our criteria, now we have evidence for specificity in terms of the effect on depression is not quite as strong and not quite as consistent. We have uh, evidence for a biologic gradient temporality. What about biologic plausibility? I'm not going to get into it too much, but there is some evidence uh, developing. Uh, we're developing an understanding of how the endocannabinoid system is involved in people who develop schizophrenia and involved in, in and there does seem to be a suggestion of biologic plausibility that's developing. There's actually some experimental evidence that's, uh, that's been uh, done as well. This, these are studies that were done about 10 years ago where um, um, uh, THC, which is the main, uh, the main or the most kind of important psychoactive compound in uh, marijuana, was given at uh, pretty high doses to uh, normal controls and also to people with schizophrenia in a separate uh, study and was able to um, provoke really uh, very much schizophrenia-like uh, psychotic experiences. These were rated using the PANS, which is the uh, positive and negative symptom scale for schizophrenia, so a, s a specific scale for schizophrenia symptoms. So, you know, and that, that's not surprising. We all know that people can have paranoia and hallucinatory experiences when they're smoking, but it's, it can be shown in a lab in environment as well. So, uh, so there's at least uh, some evidence for, for all of the uh, Bradville Hill criteria. Now, um, I wanted to spend my last couple of minutes just addressing a couple of important questions. First of all, does age matter? And uh, this is something that uh, you, know, you, re you referred to as well. Or what is, the, what is the, the link between being younger and smoking versus being older and smoking? So this is, this is one of the uh, New Zealand cohorts that was done. They had 800 kids followed since birth. They know who was smoking at age 15. They know who was smoking at age 18. They know who never smoked, and uh, at those, at least at those years, and they found that the people who were started smoking at age 15, which keep in mind is a very small number, it's, it was just 30 kids, were at fourfold greater risk of developing uh, psychotic symptoms in the study, and whereas the people who uh, smoked by age 18 were at 1.6 increased risk. Uh, and this study, this, uh, this finding has been confirmed in at least two or three of the other cohort studies as well, that there does seem to be an age effect. What has not been shown is whether that's just age or whether it's uh, a cumulative, a cumulative, like an accumulation of marijuana use, just an overall amount of marijuana use that makes a difference. Um, it's very hard to separate out because once people start, they tend to keep going. Um, Next question, does what you smoke matter? We've already heard there's all kinds of different strains of marijuana out there. Some of them are very high in THC, some of them are very low. This is uh, evidence uh, from a UK uh, context where they have a lot of people who smoke hash and they have a lot of people who smoke what's called skunk, which is a very high THC uh, um, strain of marijuana. And what they found is that the people who smoke skunk whether it's one, less than once a week, whether it's on weekends only, whether it's uh, every day, are at substantially higher risk uh, for developing a first episode of psychosis compared to the people who smoke hash or compared to the normal controls. Um, the next issue I'm just going to mention very quickly is there is it is likely that there is a shared genetic, uh, genetic basis for all this. In other words, that there's something about the brain of someone who's going to go on to develop schizophrenia that interacts in a specific way with, uh, with marijuana. 
uh, that heightens that risk. And uh, so this is just, you know, we talked about the causation, marijuana leading to psychosis or reverse causation or confounding where genetic risk leads to marijuana and psychosis, but they don't interact with each other. But what it looks like is it's probably one of these two explanations where there is a genetic risk that increases the risk of merit smoking that does also increase the risk of psychosis, but the two are not, inter are not uh, independent. They are interrelated in terms of the contribution to the risk of actually developing an illness. Or, and there's perhaps even more evidence for this, although it's still early days, that marijuana consumption, uh, the, the likelihood of developing a negative outcome for marijuana consumption is mediated by a, a genetic factor. And there's been a couple of very interesting studies that have shown this, but they're, they're still a bit too preliminary. And one, uh, one very, okay, oh, I'm out of time. Uh, so this slide is just to say that people who develop schizophrenia, if they keep smoking marijuana, they have, tend to have worse symptoms, more relapses and hospitalizations, and it may worsen their cognitive outcomes as well. And so in conclusion, we have a very strong and consistent and specific association between cannabis use and the later onset of psychosis. And a causal explanation is what best fits the data available so far and the early age, frequent use, and use of a high THC uh, strain is uh, thought to further heighten that risk. The policy implications of all that, I will leave to you guys to figure out. Thank you.